Have you guys ever come across a video or book, maybe even a television program, which focus on subject matters that you are familiar with? On the surface, it might look new and interesting, but the more you dive into it, the piece becomes a blatant form of misinformation. Worse yet, others read or view the material, and since it was created to be intentionally misleading, they view that as fact and go about spreading that misinformation. You see this all the time with movies based on historical events, and when they change something for the movie, people think that the movie is how it actually happened. Being a Titanic enthusiast, I can't help but notice the uptake of comments in my videos and others about a YouTuber named Aaron1912. For the better part of 10 years, he's been manufacturing videos where he attempts to prove how Titanic sank and split apart. The only problem with these videos is that they rely entirely on falsified survivor testimony. Intentionally cherry-picked and or misleading testimony, and they ask the viewer to completely throw the laws of physics out the window. Normally this wouldn't be a problem, and the videos would take care of themselves and get lost amongst the throngs of videos uploaded to YouTube every day. Anyone with half a brain and an ounce of common sense could look at them, see the immediate faults, and dismiss them for what they are, the wet dream of a lunatic. But sometimes reality is stranger than fiction, and somehow it seems that Aaron has managed to convince the vast majority of his audience that take the time to actually watch his videos that not only does he have a point, but that he's actually right. So, what you are about to watch is the complete dissemination of his most recent video. I'm going to pick apart his argument bit by bit in order to show you just how ridiculous his theory is. You might know some of this information. You might not know some of this information. This video is not meant to be entertaining. It will be dry and it won't be for everyone. So if you want to go ahead and click off and save yourself some time from watching it, I won't hold anything against you whatsoever. That being said, Let's put on our radiation suits and start delving into the madness of Aaron 1912. The overall basis of Aaron's theory is this. The ship struck an iceberg and the forward compartment started to flood. Within minutes of the collision, workers opened the watertight doors in order to hook up the flooding rooms to the pump system. The workers left those watertight doors open, allowing water to freely flood aft towards the stern. The ship begins to sink down vertically with very little to no angle at all until the water line reaches E-deck. Aaron then surmises that water made its way onto Scotland Road, where it caused the Titanic to list over to port. The ship continued to sink down vertically in the water until the breakup occurred. Aaron then states that the bow moved forward away from the stern during the breakup, lifted up into the air, and then sank. The middle of the ship broke off from the stern, twisted a little, and sank, and the stern then somehow lifted itself up in the air, and then sank. If you can spot the flaws in the laws of physics and logic already, good job. So, let's start at the beginning. At 11.40pm, the ship did indeed strike an iceberg, and the forward compartments pretty much immediately began flooding with water. The order to open the watertight doors aft of Boiler Room 5 came at 12.10 a.m., 30 minutes after the collision took place, not within minutes as Aaron claims. But Aaron does explain correctly why they were opened. It was to bring the suction pipes forward and hook them into the pump systems so that they could begin to pump water out of the ship. But what Aaron doesn't explain is that the only watertight doors that were opened are those forward of the engine room and aft of the flooding compartments. The watertight doors aft of the engine room and those in the flooding compartments in the bow were left as is in their closed positions. Once the watertight doors are closed, they have to be manually reopened something which Aaron conveniently omits from his theory and to you, the viewer. Why? Because he needs you to believe that all the doors were opened so that water could make its way aft into the ship. Without this crucial bit of evidence, his theory sort of makes sense, but with it added into the equation, 
The theory is already impossible, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. So, the doors have to be opened manually. Most historians that I've seen talk about this matter estimate that it would have taken approximately 10 minutes to reopen these doors. So, the next part of Aaron's theory is that the water flooded aft in the boiler rooms and began to make the ship sink down vertically in the water. So, now would probably be a good time to explain to you how the watertight door systems worked on the Olympic-class ships so that you can better understand how this would be impossible. The watertight doors could be closed in three ways. One is an electronic switch, which is how Officer Murdoch closed them when the collision occurred. The second is by manually closing the doors by hand, one at a time, and it's a very tedious job. The last way the doors could be shut was a failsafe, built into them in case the other two methods failed. This was operated by a failsafe mechanism inside the bulkhead walls adjacent to each watertight door. In the event that water began to flood a compartment, this mechanism would trigger the release inside the bulkhead and the door would immediately shut. Harlan and Wolf were some of the most innovative and experienced shipbuilders in the world at the time. Did you really think that they would design a ship with a watertight door system and not build a failsafe in case some of the men had evacuated the boiler rooms and the electronic switch device failed? Of course they didn't. Aaron conveniently left that bit of information out of his theory. In order to intentionally mislead you into thinking the ship sank, in the way that he wants it to. Which brings us to our next point in Aaron's theory. The ship sinking down vertically in the water with little to no forward list. As I explained with the watertight doors, this is impossible. As soon as water began to enter a new watertight compartment in the bow, the watertight door immediately to the rear of that compartment would slam shut to trap the water in there. But Aaron wants you to believe the ship sank down vertically for basically one reason. It explains how passengers just didn't notice the ship was sinking. So as a short counter-argument to this, I'll quote Ken Marshall, a world-renowned Titanic historian and artist, from a Titanic Channel episode about the making of the 1997 James Cameron movie. See, in order to film the 97 movie... James Cameron built approximately 80% of the entire ship and then had it set up on hydraulics so that the set could be tilted to a maximum of 6 degrees for shooting the sinking sequences. Here's what Kim Marshall had to say on the subject. And you learn so much about what they did that night and what they went through and why people reacted the way they did to certain things because we were reenacting it. It was like all these light bulbs were going off about things. For example, the ship when it was disassembled during the Christmas break in 1996 and 1997 and then re-erected at a 6 degree angle for the sinking sequences that were to come for the next several months. It was amazing how quickly we got used to that 6 degree angle. You would think that you look at it and it's at this angle and yet after walking around on the decks for just a few minutes, you forgot that the thing was angled. Now why is that important? It leads right into the fact that passengers were not all that concerned at first. So now you know how the watertight doors worked on board these ships, and how they were designed to hold back water into a compartment and keep it from freely flooding. You know that even if the workers evacuated the boiler rooms, those doors would still close and trap the water in the bow. The weight of that water would pull the bow down, which would make the stern rise up. This single-handedly proves how Aaron's theory of a vertical sinking is complete lunacy. So, now let's move on to the most infamous part of Aaron's theory, that the ship performed a V-break. Any time you try to explain to Aaron that this is nonsense, he responds with the famous sketch by Jack Thayer on board Carpathia to prove that it's true except that the sketch isn't by Jack Thayer, it's actually by an artist called Skidmore. Thayer gave his account of what happened to Skidmore while they were on the Carpathia, and Skidmore created the sketch. 
When they arrived in New York, he gave that sketch to newspapers which printed it as an explanation of what happened. Jack Thayer, for the rest of his life, whenever asked about the sketch, refused it as truth, and solemnly said that it wasn't an accurate representation of what he told Skidmore. Aaron, however, simply refers to that as fake news. A short overview of the physics behind a V-break is... The entire ship weighed 52,310 tons. The stern is comprised of roughly 25% of the ship's length, which makes it roughly 13,077 tons. The bow wreck is roughly two-thirds the length of the entire ship, which would make it roughly 34,873 tons. The middle section, as Aaron describes it, then brings up the remainder with a rate of of 4,360 tons. Once the bow is filled with water, it weighs exponentially more than 34,873 tons. Water is heavier than air, after all, and when air is forced out of the ship by incoming water, it makes the bow heavier. That is, in effect, how sinking works. Sinking 101. Air, out, water, in, water, heavy, ship, sinks. So if the bow section weighs 34,873 tons when it's completely dry, it would weigh much, much more than that during the breakup because it's full of water. In order for that much weight to move back up in the water and even out of the water, you would need something under the ship pushing it upwards, which is able to overcome the weight of the now 70,000 plus ton bow. Or, you would need the stern of the ship to be pushing downward on the rear of the bow so intensely that it forces the forwardmost part of the bow upward. I don't think I need to explain to you that it's impossible for a 13,077 ton stern and 4,360 ton middle section of the ship to put enough pressure on a 70,000 plus ton bow to make it rise up. So, unless Godzilla was underneath the ship doing a few bench presses, it's completely impossible that the bow not only moved up, but almost fully out of the water. There is no debating this. It's simple physics. Now comes the last part that I wanted to talk about, which is the survivor accounts. To show you exactly how Aaron has been lying to you when he presents you with a survivor account. If you do any digging online, particularly on Encyclopedia Titanica, you'll see the ravings of the lunatic now known as Aaron 1912 on there for the better part of 10 years. He's also been on IMDb even longer than that, I believe as far back as 2004. And it's an open secret in the Titanic community that he fabricates survivor accounts. He cherry picks what fits his theory ignores what doesn't fit his theory, and takes words completely out of context. We in the Titanic community have likewise tried to reason with him, but after him refusing to see reason for the better part of a decade, we just stopped trying to talk to him altogether. The only problem is, on YouTube, he isn't just talking to and presenting his so-called evidence to the Titanic community, He's, pre he's presenting it to anyone in the world with an internet connection to watch his stuff and be misled by it. The first survivor in his video that he quotes is a Mr. Mellers, which Aaron states, Suddenly her nose, of which I was standing on, seemed to rise from underneath the water. What actually happened to Mr. William J. Mellers was he had been standing on the boat deck near Collapsible A when he noticed the ship taking a sudden dip down. This caused a wave, reported by other passengers, to come running up the boat deck. Mellers was swept off the deck and into the water right next to Collapsible A. It's also worthy to note that due to the first funnel falling and a second wave hitting the lifeboat, it was pushed approximately 50 yards from the ship. What Mellers actually said was, When I came to my senses, I saw the ship part in the middle with the stern standing several hundred feet out of the water. 
which tells you right there that Mellors was either knocked unconscious or he wasn't aware of what was happening to the ship during the breakup. So again, how did he see a quote-unquote V-break happen if he states in his survivor testimony, when I came to my senses? This is a blatant example of how Aaron lies to you and intentionally misleads you when he presents you with survivor testimony. So let's move on to the next survivor. Mrs. Hippock. Aaron states that, she said, the ship's bow rose up in the air as the steamer sank toward the center. The full quote from what Mrs. Lewis Hippock said is this, Then we started to row. I knew the ship was sinking fast because I saw the portholes were near the water. We heard someone cry in an appealing voice to come back and get more passengers, but we did not dare to. The boat listed so much to one side that I felt sure we would be swamped. When we had rowed about 150 yards from the Titanic, we heard a fearful explosion. I saw the ship split open. At the same time, the ship's bow rose up in the air as the steamer sank toward the center. We expected to be sucked into the ocean in the wake of the Titanic, and I closed my eyes. I waited and waited. Finally, I opened my eyes, and the Titanic was gone. Now here we have a passenger that seems to coincide with Aaron's theory, with the mentioning of the bow rising up and sinking toward the center, but yet again, Aaron has deceived you. He intentionally never mentions the mysterious listing the ship suffered just before the final plunge took place moments before the breakup. If you delve into the survivor accounts, you'll see that many people standing on the ship when it began to plunge mention that it felt like the bow moved up before it dipped down. You'll also see many conflicting reports about the ship's list, whether it had a port list or, as some passengers recalled, returned to an even keel. So let me show you where Mrs. Hippick was, and let me load in a model of Titanic for you. Okay, that's nice. Uh, the ship had a 9 degree port list, and it was down by the head approximately 10 degrees when the plunge began. If you factor in the ship returning to an even keel and eliminating its port list, oh my god, it looks like the bow rose up out of the water, doesn't it? Aaron strikes again. So let's move on to the next survivor, Mrs. Chaffee. Aaron states, The middle seemed to go down, lifting bow and stern into the air. Her full quote is, The ship sank steadily until just at the last when it plunged rapidly. Just before going down, it seemed to writhe, breaking into three parts into which it was divided. First, the middle seemed to go down lifting bow and stern into the air. Then it twisted the other way, throwing the middle up. Finally, the bow went under, and it plunged stern last. Like Mrs. Hippock before, Mrs. Chaffee was also in boat four, so we can use the same point of view for Mrs. Hippock. Chaffee indicates that before the ship began to plunge, that it writhed and broke into three segments. This writhing motion is consistent with what I explained during the Hippic segment, where the ship returned from a port list to an even keel. As for her explanation of the ship breaking into three segments, I'll defer to Roy Mangott here. He stated that the ship most likely did break into multiple segments. What he called the aft and forward towers had their internal structure shoved upwards by the bending of the keel. Just as Cat Chaffee claims, the bow went down and the stern followed last. Notice how even in Roy's diagram, the bow only moves up ever so slightly, but not entirely out of the water like Aaron claims. This is yet another example of Aaron taking a survivor's words completely out of context and refusing to look at it from multiple ways that it could have happened. So next up, let's do Mrs. Cameron. All she says in Aaron's video is, and the ends were sticking up. Mrs. Cameron's full quote is, we got about two miles from the Titanic and watched her sink. She just broke in two and the ends were sticking up for about five minutes. This again seems to support Aaron's theory. 
but it's an error in slang. People spoke differently at the turn of the century than they do now. If you look through several survivor accounts, you'll notice that many of them refer to the ship's bow as her bows. Notice how they refer to the singular bow and being plural by adding an S to it. Mrs. Cameron has done the same thing in her statement with the end. When you read the statement and understand the slang, it reads as follows. We got about two miles from the Titanic and watched her sink. She just broke in two, and the end was sticking up for about five minutes. So, lastly, I want to take a look at, uh, let's say, Richard Norris Williams. Aaron claims that Williams said, And the forward end bounded up again. I felt the deck come up right under me. I found we were high and dry. Here is a brilliant example of Aaron taking what a survivor says and intentionally twisting their words to mislead you, because not only has Aaron completely made up part of this testimony, but he took words from multiple testimonies in order to make what he wants you to read sort of make sense. Here are the multiple actual accounts of what Richard Norris Williams said about Titanic. The first is a note from Walter Lord, the author of A Night to Remember. He said, Water catches up with them, he and his father, and sweeps them from the deck toward the stern. The ship seems to be rushing forward and down, making the wave that engulfs them. Father is swept away, carried overboard himself, hears a last word from father, strikes out swimming, thinks he goes a mile, actually 50 to 100 feet, turns around and watches in astonishment as Titanic towers over him. Despite the horror and the peril, can't help feeling it's a majestic sight. The Titanic rises, settles back, then starts rising again, this time all the way. Stern rises right out of the water, till rudder and three propellers are clearly visible right above, seems to twist around in a semicircle, then plunges straight down. The second is Richard Norris Williams's account from his own memoir. It was an extraordinary sight. As the bow went under, the stern lifted higher and higher into the air, then pivoted and swung slowly over my head. Looking straight up, I saw the three propellers and the rudder distinctly outlined against the clear sky. She described just about a semicircle, and then slid into the ocean, ocean facing England. No suction, no noise, Two or three big waves, stillness, then the cries and yells of 1,600 people struggling in the ice-cold water. The final recollection that I have of Richard Norris Williams was taken while on board Carpathia. The forward end, where we stood, was sinking rapidly, and before we could jump together, the water washed my father over. Then, with explosions, the ship seemed to break in two, and the forward end bounded up again for an instant. I leaped, but with dozens in the water between us, my father was lost to me. See how Aaron bent this man's words and took things out of context intentionally to make it support his V-break theory and misled you in the process? When you see the full quotes, it becomes abundantly clear what this man saw during the night of the sinking, and yet Aaron would have you believe in the ridiculous Herculean monstrosity of a V-break. Those are only the first five survivor accounts that Aaron has saw fit to quote in his video. He quoted several more, and with each quote, he doesn't give you the full account of what someone says, he takes things out of context, each account has been cherry-picked, and he blatantly ignores things that do not line up with his theory, or he will straight up fabricate what someone says in order to make it fit into his theory. Aaron 1912 is a lunatic who cannot comprehend how physics works, even at the most basic and fundamental level. He is a madman who will not listen to reason. When you show him a survivor quote that he is intentionally misquoted, he rages at you with all the ferocity of a weeping toddler. I've had a run-in with him once on Encyclopedia Titanica, where I tried to provide him with more survivor testimony, not in an angry and biased way like I've done in this video, but calmly and collectively. Aaron responded to this calm and collective response by messaging the site's administrators and reporting me for harassing him. 
As time has worn on, I've grown tired of having to explain the sheer stupidity of his theories to people, and so I made this video. If you're someone who doesn't like me, and doesn't like the videos that I make, that's fine. I can't please everyone, and I don't want to please everyone. But one thing you'll never be able to say about my videos or my channel is that I blatantly lie to my viewers and mislead them by fabricating evidence in order to get more attentions and views. I always include sources to everything I use and quote in other videos either by the videos themselves or in the video description. That way, you can feel free to disagree with me all you want, read my sources, and form your own conclusions. Aaron, on the other hand, does the exact opposite. But what can you expect from someone to, who seems to have spent his entire life inside a bubble, unwilling to accept any other reality but their own?